Good morning. Y'all can sit together if you want to. It's just quick room. Yeah. Uh, today, you know, we're going to have bad weather. And I want to appreciate, I'll tell you about it. I appreciate you coming in this nasty weather because I know it's a little more difficult to be here. It's raining, it's cold, it's threatening snow and ice. So actually, it's going to have a snow ice. So this morning, we have got Mr. Raya, and he's going to tell us a lot about the parts and uh, advertising and marketing and products he has and stuff. And so I'm really looking forward to that because that's my, my, my comfort zone. And without further ado, let me just introduce him. And he has the full hour if he wants it. <laughs> instructions that I read on the website were tell your story so here we go I guess uh, my name is Ty Wright out and I'm unemployed which is just one syllable away from self-employed so I always like to say that uh, so maybe I am self-employed with Abbott Promotions Incorporated and I have a, a real estate business uh, also uh, so definitely self-employed have been my whole adult life uh, which means of course that I can work any 70 hours a week that I want to so, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know uh, when I was in high school, I was a pretty good student. Uh, I think some of you know my brother, uh, Andy, who's a, a horticulture agent here. And he and I mowed lawns, and by the time I was 16 or 17, you know, he went to college, and I still had these lawns, and you know, I was probably mowing 40 to 50 lawns a week in high school, and had a couple of employees, so making money in high school, uh, almost like an adult, so, uh, which of course is a bad thing because it provides no incentive to go to college, uh, you know, and I was a pretty good student. Uh, so anyway, uh, I did go to the community college and pick up an associate's degree in about 1993 or so. And, but I was really too busy with my business to, or I felt like the business was more important than, than you know, learning, I guess. And so by about 2001, you know, I'd grown the business to, uh, you know, seven or eight lines a week and landscape projects and so forth and a handful of employees and was really getting burned out on managing entry level uh, laborers and working the field myself was just really getting burned out. So, uh, <coughs> took about eight years of that for me to realize that, you know, I needed the knowledge. If I ever wanted to kind of expand my business scope, I needed to go back to school. And, uh, so I did go back to school, got my bachelor's, got my MBA, and about the same time I went back to school, I started uh, Abbott Promotions, uh, and I started the business because I'd been helping some of my contractor friends with their marketing efforts anyway. They would see what I was doing and were impressed by it and wanted me to help them, so I would help them, and it ended up where I'm helping them a bunch, and I'm thinking, okay, this is crazy. I, I should be getting paid for this, so, uh, so anyway. You know, I purposefully decided when I started at promotions that I didn't want to leverage, uh, you know, I wanted to grow my top line and my bottom line each year, but I didn't want to do it just by leveraging people or headcount. I had already proven that HR was not my forte. It wasn't something I enjoyed greatly. Uh, so, you know, I decided I wanted a business where I could leverage ideas more than uh, just headcount. Uh, so, you know, at Ad Promotions, we help our clients with graphic design, with print work, uh, with corporate apparel, trade show displays, uh, and of course results. Uh, and, you know, when I began the business, one of the first challenges was just my lack of industry knowledge. I mean, I didn't know squat. I went into a kind of cold turkey. And, uh, you know, I countered that by becoming an independent rep for a large national distributor. And that was okay, it helped a tiny bit, but I found out real quick that, you know, there was stuff that I wanted to do that wasn't within their scope. And I mean, within a few weeks, I knew that, you know, I wouldn't continue to, to sell to them. So, um, but I still needed more industry knowledge. Uh, so I paid an industry consultant a couple hundred bucks for some educational materials. And uh, looking back at the materials, it's they were very simplistic and kind of cheesy, but 
at the time they were worth their weight in gold because you know just a little bit of industry knowledge went a long way and you had nothing. So, uh, so I joined a, a industry organization, PPI, uh, which is Promotion Products Association of uh, International Leather. Uh, so I joined that and got some more education within the industry, and that was all helpful. Uh, so one of the next challenges that I faced uh, was prioritizing time by prospect. You know, in a lot of industries, the challenge is just to get new customers. Uh, at a restaurant, I assume that's a, that's a challenge. You know, get new customers every day. Uh, in my industry, though, many times the challenge is to serve more of your current client's needs. Or to say it differently, you know, you need to get a bigger piece of their advertising pie. You get this little big slice and you need to get more. Uh, with small business clients, a lot of times their, their expectations and their goals don't really align with their budgets. So, uh, you know, men and women are created equal, prospects are not. And what I mean by that is, you know, in the marketing field, you simply can't afford to serve every client. You do have to have to choose. Uh, so, you know, we began we began to do occasional work. Uh, the occasional spec work for, for reasonable prospects, so you know, and also known as doing work for free. You know, we would design things just hoping that we would be able to sell them something. So uh, we also began to donate uh, in-kind services to local nonprofits, about every one in Henderson. Uh, and that both of those were very valuable tools that we continue to use to this day. Uh, not as much as what we used to, but. Uh, very valuable tools for, for getting your foot in the door uh, in our industry. Uh, so another challenge of the business was finding good suppliers. And, and I really don't mean just good suppliers, I mean incredible suppliers that uh, help us sell their line of products and services. Uh, you know, we need suppliers uh, that deliver consistent quality day after day, time after time. Uh, and early on in the business, we really didn't have that. Uh, we didn't have a small stable of, of trusted suppliers. We used about any supplier we could find that we thought had our parameters. Uh, you know, <coughs> and in my business, you really, uh, like a lot of businesses, I guess, you really do risk your reputation with each and every project that you work on. So, you know, a lot of times, the, you know, uh, you use a bad supplier and, and, and bad things happen. Uh, so it took a few years after that to really uh, figure out how to manage that small, stable, steady suppliers or reliable suppliers. But now we actually use software that lets us uh, rate those suppliers on six different categories, and you know we can we can tell uh, pretty quickly using software uh, if it makes sense for us to use a supplier for a particular project. So uh, it took a few years for us to really hone our business model. Uh, lots of folks in my industry don't really uh, produce anything in-house. Uh, a lot of times they're known as ad specialty distributors or promotional products distributors. Uh, and then the flop side of that coin is that uh, there's folks who produce everything in-house. So a lot of times they're known as printers or uh, graphic design firms. Uh, so after just a few years, our model evolved through, through hybrid. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, we let the client's needs, we, we, let their, we let their budget, their turnaround time, their quantity determine whether we're going to produce it in-house or have it produced by our uh, uh, trusted supplier network. Uh, and that approach, though, very simplistic, and I won't say it's completely unique, but it is a little bit different, and that approach uh, has made all the difference in terms of a, a business model that works. It kind of lets us act in a fashion similar to an independent insurance agent as far as choosing the best supplier for the project. But at the same time, when the budget and the turnaround time and the quantity don't allow uh, for that type of uh, arrangement, we don't lose the client. We either produce it in house or we won't work with a, a very local partner to, to get it done. Uh, so we really do focus every project on that particular client's uh, needs and the peculiarities of that project. So, what that's done for us, uh, in retrospect, is easy to see is that you know it's created a client base uh, that's very broad. Uh, 
none of our, there, we don't have any single client that makes up more than 10% of our revenue, wow. uh, which, you know, that's, that's, exactly. that's huge. In our industry, there's, there's case after case of marketing firms or advertising firms that uh, land a great account. You know, it, it ends up being 30, 40, 50, 60% of the business, they lose that account, they lose their business, uh, not uncommon at all. Uh, so that, that breadth of our customer base uh, really helped us weather what a lot of, you know, the recession that a lot of small businesses felt about 07, 08. One other tweak our business model is that uh, for small business marketing, we really recognize that you can only grow your business one of four ways. You can either uh, get new customers, or you can get your current customers to spend more, or you can get your current customers to spend more often, or you can sell at a higher margin. And what we've learned about over the last decade is that most existing businesses uh, spend way too much time and effort on the first way to get new customers. And if they're an established business with established sales trends and uh, customer base, nine times out of 10, they probably should be focusing more on you know, getting their current clients to spend more and getting their current clients to spend more often. You know, increasing that, the size of the ticket and increasing the frequency uh, and then selling product, they can act product or services they can actually make money on. Uh, so, uh, so today, after promotions, uh, you know, we provide marketing products and services to clients throughout the country, big businesses, small businesses, tons of nonprofit. About probably, I'm going to say, 70% of our revenue is local. Uh, about 30% uh, across the country, and that's all I've got. Is uh, I meet my contract. I'm, I'm shy. I'm shy. I don't believe that. Right. <laughs> so, but I'm happy to entertain uh, any questions. And, uh, when you said uh, your your quality of suppliers, I in my mind I'm thinking, okay, what supplies would a, would a market? You know, are we talking about tangible like paper and things like that? Or are we talking about services? Most of the time, we're talking about products that we're sourcing from one supplier for the product and the decoration uh, for a particular promotion. So as an example, uh, a bank that uh, we're working with, a bank in Henderson right now is rebranding. Uh, they're trying to flesh out their brand. And uh, to do that, you know, they're looking for products and services that are unique to their brand. So uh, I'm rambling, I may not be answering the No, no, question. that's fine. Yeah, we're, you know, we're working with suppliers who provide usually both the product and the decoration for a particular promotion. Uh, sometimes it's not that way. I mean, sometimes we're source of blank product, another contract decoration firm. Uh, so you're talking about a bank that's marketing products such as like a, a, kid, a youth piggy bank, sorry, your kid's checking account, and doing the small piggy bank. So doing the, the calendars, you're doing the ink pens and the pencils and the mouse pads and things yeah. like that. Are you also coming up with designs and new products as in new ways that they can um, like come in with the idea of how they can put together a youth um, checking account and savings account and what the parameters of that would be? Absolutely. We, we, we love nothing more than if they give us a specific objective and a time frame and a budget uh, and, you know, challenge us how to meet that. So, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of stuff is around a particular theme, so it might be if it's a dental or a unit, it might be a baseball thing. So we may be looking for specific uh, baseball oriented, uh, you know, products or services that reinforce that thing. Uh, so. Do you do market campaigns and print campaigns as well? We, 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 we definitely in house we produce uh, paper print, uh, wide format print, uh, some apparel. So uh, we most definitely try to do. We try to encompass most of the project in terms of, uh, we don't do any media placement, uh, and we don't do any uh, uh, web work, but about everything else that's encompassed within uh, advertising for, for small businesses, we're, we're probably done. So, it's tough. so uh, you said that your, your client base is now nationwide, or maybe even, <coughs> What, what's the mix? Uh, how much do you source locally? Um, you have a rough ratio? Uh, yeah, as far as, uh, as 
far as sourcing locally, I'm, I, I couldn't tell you that number. As far as producing in-house, I'm going to say approximately maybe 30 percent of the products and services we produce in-house. Uh, you know, I have a couple of yeah. designers and uh, you know some print capabilities. So, uh, so maybe 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 about that number. And, and I'm sorry, I, I really meant uh, made the wrong word. How much of your client base is local? How much? Oh, we got you. Roughly seventy percent. Okay. Uh, yeah, roughly seventy percent. With the other thirty percent, uh, maybe half of that is coming from internet sales that uh, uh -huh. that we don't really have a strong relationship with the client. Whereas maybe fifteen percent there is coming from clients. You know, that may have a headquarters local, and for whatever reason, we're doing work. Yeah. Know, uh, on a national basis. So. Okay. What point did you find that you flipped that model from working all the time and not getting paid to, to hiring people and having an established business that's and then adding on the sure. and then adding on to more people and then reaching out to more people? That's a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, we help other businesses grow their business. So, I mean, we obviously want to grow our business, but from where to go, uh, I won't say that I've restricted growth, but we, you know, we purposefully have grown our top line about seven or eight percent a year historically for the last 12 years uh, with a slight dip in 07. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, I'm not sure as far as the headcount, you know, the headcount no, today is only about seven, so uh, it grew from one to seven. Over well, there's only a point where you suddenly decided, oh cool, I can hire somebody. How do I do that? Do that? I did do that from more, I did that from more to go, okay. mainly because there are some tedious tasks that I personally am not good at, uh, don't enjoy them, don't want to do them. I would go get a job before I had to do them. So I knew from more to go that there was some, you know, uh, bookkeeping slash uh, or processing stuff that I wouldn't be good at and didn't want to do. So from more to go, I did start out with an employee kind of built from there and, and the next hire was a designer. Uh, so but see that's a question that would apply to almost any small business right back to your lawn mowing business where you start out you're the guy on a lawn mower and you're zipping around and you need some help you hire another guy at some point when you get two three guys you got to get off your lawn mower and supervise them sure so you've now you can be, probably write a book title get off your lawn mower <laughs> we started in the we started in the service business. I was a service technician. My brother was a service technician. So we knew our business, but we you know we had to learn the business. Sure. So you start out and you're given great service because you're the guy sitting here doing the service. Now when we need a little help, usually it started out as you know. You hire the dumb help, you know, grab the other end of this thing and we're going to move it. Then you got to get smarter help or else train them. Sure. But as you grow, you'll find, we found, that our quality of service went down a little bit because the motivation for the people we hired wasn't the same as the motivation that I had. So now then, I found, Terry and I sat down and decided one of us has got to, you know, oversee this and the other one's got to hang in there with the service and oversee the service. So with that you start growing but you're no longer the guy driving the lawnmower. You are now the guy driving the business. So you got to pretty well forget about you ever going back to driving the lawnmower because that's not productive. Sure. You've got to manage the business and I think every business faces that. I agree totally. Get off your lawnmower. <laughs> it, that kind of alludes to, to what I see as a classic uh, uh, kind of commonality in small business and that's that you talk about your service declining at a certain point there. And, you know, part of that is the agency problem or the fact that the employee uh, is less likely to care about service than the, the owner or manager. Uh, but the other thing that comes into play there with almost every business is just managing the flow of work. I mean, it's, you know, you talk to any contractor that either they've got too much or they don't sure. have enough. Well, that same concept applies to almost every business that I've ever worked with, and the challenge is having systems and processes and people that can still provide good service when, you know, you either have, you have to have a relief valve of some sort, whether it's flexible labor force or whether it's uh, uh, saying no, new client, we can't, 
we can't take on this new project, but managing that flow of work to where the service level remains the same, yeah, and that's, I'm sure that applies in the restaurant business more than anything, uh, but I've seen it apply in almost every business. The, the, the no single client is greater than 10%. I mean, everybody yeah, shoots right. for that, but that's astounding. I've yeah. never heard anybody who actually pulled yeah. it off. How, I mean, there's got to be people that are demanding, and you've got to have clients that are trying to be 50% of your business. Absolutely, man. I'll give you a good example in our business. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, we had a client in California that uh, we started doing uh, print work for them, and it was quasi-complicated print work. And what I mean by that, there was variable data. We basically, they brought a project to us uh, at the infancy of their business, and we showed them a better way to do it, at which point their business grew, our business grew, and after about five or six, seven years, uh, the revenue that they uh, gave us every year was in the uh, ballpark of about $130,000, significant account for, for our small business. Uh, so uh, when we lost, when, at, at that point, at, at some point there, it did get near that 10%, and honestly, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't totally fearful of losing the account, mainly because I purposely hadn't uh, invested in overhead uh, for that specific account. We right. did have variable costs associated with that particular account, but those costs could be gotten rid of fairly quickly. Uh, but I, I do think that's the challenge. If you do, if you do have a client that's uh, cranking up, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of your revenue damn well better not have overhead that's specific to that client. It better be variable cost, you know, uh, or, or overhead that you can shed quickly. Uh, so we, 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 have, we have been close to that point. I don't want to be close to that point. You know, I, uh, there, there's a lot of recession proofness, which isn't learned, I'm sure, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of security in having a lot of small accounts. Sure. So especially, especially if they span a, a wide range of, you know, if they're diversified by industry and if they're diversified by the products or services that you're giving them, I mean, you know, that, that, that produces a lot of stability to uh, revenue uh, streams. In your busy time, do you increase overtime or do you hire more employees? Uh, usually overtime. Uh, yeah. It's, that's, uh, that's the way we chose to do it. Yeah, it's expensive. But, but you, you, you know, made it quicker. It's, yeah, you, you've got a lot of, you know, you've got a lot of uh, unknowns when, when you bring on new people. You've got to change Can you keep them busy during your slow season? Yeah, the other, other relief valve, of course, is, you know, outsourcing a particular yeah. function. And, and we, we definitely have employed that a uh, few different ways, mainly with graphic design. Uh, or temporary know, help. Tem temporary help. Or in our business, uh, because of the uh, hybrid nature of our business, you know, there may be examples of, uh, things that we would do in-house during a store period that if it's on the bubble uh, and we're busy, we're probably not going to produce it in-house. You know, if, if it's on the bubble and we can produce it with a national supplier. Just take a hit on the margin. Take a little bit of hit on the margin, absolutely. So because you know the, the stuff you do in-house uh, always comes with indirect costs that are hard to measure. When, when you're outsourcing yeah. a project totally, it's real easy to measure. You know, you know your margin. Unless something goes awry with the project, which happens, but uh, you know it's a lot easier to measure your margin when you're when you're outsourcing the bulk of the, the work. Your team right now. Can you explain what uh, what kind of team we've got? Absolutely. Kind of what kind of their sure. what their strengths and weaknesses are. Yep. We've got a customer service person who handles a lot of the order processing, uh, talking to folks when they come in. We've got a, a co-op student from the high school that uh, helps deflect uh, at the front desk. We've got uh, uh, a college student who's worked for me about five years who uh, does a little bit of everything, including any kind of assembly or production kind of things. We've got a graphic designer uh, who's very knowledgeable uh, uh, and experienced. Uh, we've got another graphic designer who's less experienced. Uh, we've got another production per person uh, that's comprehensive. Yeah, it, I mean, you know, our, the headcount purpose for being kept small, but you know, they're each important kind of things, and we do we try our best to do a lot of cross uh, skill kind of stuff, you know, because in a small business, uh, you 
you know, everybody definitely has to wear a lot of hats, you know. Uh, if, excuse me, one person misses work and, you know, you've lost 16.66% of your workforce or whatever, you know. <laughs> so, uh, what program do you use for a project management program? Uh, we use, a, we use a, a online tool called Trello. Uh, it's, a, it's significant for helping us uh, reprioritize quickly. Uh, for assigning tasks, it has the hazard of uh, it will allow micromanagement if you let it, uh, but it, it helps keep everybody on the same page uh, and it helps reprioritize quickly, uh, which in our business is huge. I'm using that a months ago. I'm sorry. Base camps, and yeah. I'm using that really like this yeah. so far. Yeah, we, we, we test a lot of those because, uh, you know, that information management is huge, mm -hmm. even for a little micro business like ours, it's, it's humongous. Uh, by being on the same page, otherwise balls get dropped. I mean, there's, you know, uh, we deemed that one a little too comprehensive for what we wanted, as far as uh, a little too broad a scope for, for what we wanted. But we test on a bunch of them because we know it's important. You know. Uh, How much cross training are you doing? Uh, I mean, it's, it, we don't have any formal cross training programs, but uh, specifically, you know, my folks know that. Uh, Everything's about the deadline. A lot of our stuff is event-oriented, or even if it's not event-oriented, our client is giving us a firm deadline. Even if it's a fudged deadline, it's real to us because <coughs> we're giving to us by our client. Uh, it's me. I have to ask, why ABBA? Uh, sure. At the time when I was running another business, uh, Yellow Page Advertising was uh, important. I uh, wanted a business name that was short and sweet, came first in the Yellow Pages. So if it was today, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't approach it the same way. <coughs> what's your, uh, what's, what's the challenge, the new challenge now, or the living challenge out there for you? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say probably the biggest challenge would be uh, is keeping a tight lid on our, our, our in-house uh, work because it could get out of hand quickly, meaning that you know. I, I don't want to leverage, you know, I want to grow the top line, I want to grow the bottom line, but I don't want to do it by having a large commercial print operation. And I don't want to do it by managing 100 people. Uh, but some of our, I got to make sure that some of our in-house stuff is not so unique uh, that we can't have it produced uh, somewhere else, if that makes sense. So yeah. uh, specifically to the, you know, to, to use a blatant example of the, that's, uh, thing to understand well, even if you're not in the industry is you know uh, with print work especially the quantity a lot of times determines the process that makes the most sense so if you come and you want a single sign and you want it tomorrow we're probably not going to do it unless you're already a regular client and you're not spending all this money anyway and you know we're probably going to accommodate you know if you're a great client we're going to jump through all kinds of hoops to make sure that we help you with your deadline we probably would produce that in-house that day if we had to yeah. Whatever it takes to make sure that our client looks good to their boss, that they make their deadline, you know, whatever we got to do. Uh, if you have a project uh, for uh, 25 signs, say you're a roofer, you know, 25 signs, we've got a week. <coughs> it's kind of on the bubble. We could produce an in-house if we want to, we don't have to. Uh, if you have a thousand signs, it'd be crazy for my shop to produce that in-house. It wouldn't make economic sense. It, it wouldn't make sense on levels. So my point is that if we have a specific kind of uh, project like we do a lot of uh, point of purchase kind of short run graphic stuff and uh, if we build our business and we uh, we have clients that we've uh, trained to expect crazy turnaround times on stuff that we yeah. need to produce in-house and that part of the business grows significantly that it's a little bit of a risk yeah. on meeting the service Expectation, yeah, downstream when they need something that's a greater bulk. Yeah, that's interesting. Interesting. Question for me is I'm reading this, I know that you've been worked on several political campaigns. How does that work with what you already do? Because you're already busy, <coughs> and sure. the political campaign by nature of the beast is, is extremely stressful. I, absolutely. So, a lot of the campaigns we've worked on have been uh, local campaigns, a few statewide campaigns. Uh, our part in those is usually pretty limited to. Uh, just uh, producing product within a certain time frame. We will help with uh, things like uh, simplistic press releases or maybe radio scripts uh, or newspaper ad 
kind of stuff, but pretty limited in that regard. So it, it fleshes with the rest of the model because of, of the just commonality behind producing a consistent visual image. Uh, so I don't know if that answered your question or not. It uh, does, other than the fact that you have such a volume at that point in time, and they do expect to create turnaround times because things change like that. Sure. The, the the relief value using a national supplier distributor or national supplier kind of network gives us a relief kind of built-in relief valve, meaning that um, you know if you wanted five thousand signs by Friday, I probably could pull it off. You know, yeah. learn some more parameters, but I don't know if that answered. It does. That helps or not. The, uh, but we do we do rely on our supplier network as a relief valve. Uh, we just got to be careful that we don't train our customer base to be something that we can't source easily with that supplier network. If you're making, if you're making the commercials and you're doing the print ads, why are you not placing them as well? As an additional uh, we we purposely limit that part of our business just as a uh, we we help them with their whole campaign to the extent that uh, well let me say differently a lot of times we we make money on products we give value added services so. We don't really sell the newspaper uh, ad as much as we uh, help them with it. Whole package. There you go. Help them with the whole. Because people are uh, kind of trending toward kind of a one stop kind of thing. You know, they don't want to, if you're managing a large event, uh, you don't want to have to go to the t shirt shop and go to the banners made over here and then have somebody else help. You know, they, they want, I mean, every client's different, but even small business clients. They don't want to have to work with five different vendors. Yeah. There's a lot of value in, in, in us. You know, we get a lot of work just by saying yes, meaning that, uh, you know, we, we really wield the tool of flexibility, which is the biggest tool that a small business has. You know, they'll call and they'll say, you know, can I have 17 banners and, uh, you know, 2,000 t-shirts. You know, yeah, we've got to have somebody fix this Word document so we can send it. Well, I mean, we'll do it, you know, whatever little piece to the puzzle We'll say yes, and we'll do the whole whole thing. Whereas a lot of times, a large company wouldn't have that flexibility. Uh, it's impressive. Yeah, well, it's fun. You know, it's uh, uh, it's it's fun because you do truly get to help that client meet their deadline, even though they have all these crazy parts to it. Plus, it's such a part when you're looking at a nationwide contracts like you're talking about down here, because they're always about um, I don't know, you know, like being done really answer some questions I need. I can't get sure. anybody to do extra or over and above what I paid them for. And then we say, well, in Kentucky, we, we, we believe in customer service. That's just how we roll. Sure. So it's kind of interesting. Well, and literally being able to, as a small business, you literally not just customer service, yeah. you literally being able to change your process and your product offering to, you know, that's something that larger businesses just can't do yeah. uh, effectively. Do you handle, or how much of your billing, accounting, things like this, do you handle in-house? Um, also, we outsource, uh, you know, somebody for, uh, I think we, our uh, outsourced accountant does uh, our sales tax uh, returns, uh, we outsource our payroll, uh, but most of the other functions we keep. They'll handle stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and our outside uh, firm helps us, uh, like they do our bank reconciliations. They're kind of they're kind of like a double check on on the in house too mm -hmm. to make sure that we're not screwing something up. So that's the part I hate the most. So, <laughs> I hate the most. Do we have any questions? I know we put him up against the wall up here because we have we have the extra thirty minutes here, but he's done a great job. Huh. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. Yeah. some good people coming in the next couple of weeks. We do have an opening on April the 1st. First, if you know anybody that um, has a business that wants to present at One Million Cups, let us know who they are and we'll get in touch with them and get them set up to do that. And please drive carefully this afternoon because the roads are going to get really slick real fast after one. We're adjourned. I've got one more follow-up Oh, question. never mind. Sure. Stop. <laughs> How are you related to Andy Rida? I am. Yeah. yeah you missed that part. What? I'm sorry. Yeah, I know. How are you related? How are you? Uh, brother. Oh, okay. Great. Right. Right. To specify, I have hair. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is a resemblance, but not, you know, I knew you weren't twins. <laughs>